Welcome to another episode of Yesterday's Capers. I'm Abdullah Molim and every week I will bring you the very best shows from the past that the world has to offer. It's a spin-off week. Yes, that's right. We're looking at TV shows that try to make it on its own based on the success of their parent show. And we've got Joni Las Chachi from Happy Days, Tucker's Luck from Grange Hill and Joey from Friends. How you doing? Three interesting shows with intriguing characters and I for one can't wait to talk about these shows. So, let's get started. And uh, joining me as ever is producer Paul. Hey man, how's it going? Yeah, I'm alright thanks. It's always the case that I always think about things after the fact. So, for example, when we talk about Gladiators, it was one of, the, I think the show's director was Nigel Lithko, and he was the, one of the sort of the architects of pop stars. So it was one of the things that he had a, a stranglehold on uh, Saturday night television. And after the end of Gladiators, he managed to find a way to like get back that that stranglehold again with uh, pop stars and then pop stars, the rivals. And I think even, yeah, he might have been behind Pop Idol. I don't think, I don't think he had anything to do with X Factor. X Factor was kind of like down the line sort of thing. And I think it may have been started somewhere else and then went everywhere. Because I think Pop, I- Pop Idol definitely, I think, started here. And then American Idol became a thing and so on and so forth. But I think, yeah, with, with originally Pop Stars and then Pop Stars The Rivals. I remember who won the very first Pop Stars. It could have just been, I think, when they were making Hearsay and Liberty X. That could have just been yeah. And then the the other one, Pop Stars Rivals, when they made Girls Aloud and the boy band, who uh, I can't even think of their name. I can't even think who they are. They didn't stand a chance. They didn't stand a chance on that show and in real life. Everything. I think I think everybody had their hearts set on uh, Girls Aloud, and uh, there you go. But no, that was that was one interesting thing that I probably forgot to uh, mention. Uh, an interesting tidbit from last week. Nasty Nigel, I think they used to call him. I think so. They used to call him Nasty Nigel. Because obviously he used to be like really mean. Oh, you can't sing. I don't, I'm sure. They used to call him, yeah, Nasty Nigel. Nice, neat, nasty Nigel. Yeah, I'm sure of it. Yeah, I mean, all those shows go away over my head. I don't watch those. Well, obviously they don't exist anymore. But but but, but yeah, back then they used to be a very big thing. I, I remember, I think I got off the train at like... At like 10, 5, 10 years ago. Cause yeah, you still watch these shows religiously. It's Saturday nights. What do you want? It's- I mean, I watched um, Pop Idol, I think. Yeah. And that's the only one I watched. I didn't watch any more X Factor or anything like that. I can't even tell you who won those shows either, to be honest. I think, did Gareth Gates win or did Will Gareth, Young win? Will Young won the first ever Pop Idol. And I guess, was that the last ever Pop Idol as well? Gareth Gates was a second. Close second. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay, okay, I, okay, I, okay. I remember that, but I remember who else won. I'm sure they did a couple seasons of, uh, of Pop Idol. But uh, yeah. To be fair, I I loved all those shows and I watched all those shows up until a point where it was like, yeah, this is these shows are getting stupid. The format is stupid. The judges are stupid. The contestants are stupid. Everyone's stupid. I just thought, right, I'm getting off the train and. Uh, Five years later, everybody else followed. Well, they followed because they don't exist anymore, but uh, there you go. Right, I mean, this is a very interesting week. It's, 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 like I said, it's a spin-off week. So this is like the, the shows that try to say, you know what? These characters are great. Let's see how they get on on their Let, own. Yeah, let's milk it, <laughs> I think is what they probably said. For one of them only. It's only, it only applies for one of them. Happy Days was still a thing when Journey Loves Chachi came out. And when Journey Loves Chachi ended, Happy Days was still a thing. It was still a show that was running. Grange Hill, the same. It was still a show that was running. It was only when Friends ended, they thought, oh, okay, let's just get Joey Triviani to do the, the show. So uh, there you go. But uh, we'll kick off with uh, Journey Loves Chachi. Because that came out first in March 1982. And some of the things happening in the world. The United States placed an embargo on Libyan oil imports, alleging Libyan state-sponsored terrorism. Argentine scrap metal workers infiltrated by Marines. 
raised the flag of Argentina on South Georgia in the Falkland Islands, the British Overseas Territory. All nine planets recognized at this time align on the same side of the sun, known as Syzygy. Porky's was in the cinema, and uh, the synth pop classic The Damned Don't Cry by Visage was in the charts. Joni Loves Chachi. So this was a American sitcom TV series and a spin-off of Happy Days that stars Erin Moran and Scott Bio as the characters Joni Cunningham and Chachi Arcola, respectively. The series is set in the early to mid-1960s and follows the exploits of Joni and Chachi as they move to Chicago and try to make it on their own with a rock band and a music career at a time when the British invasion was looming. They even had an episode called Beatlemania, which somehow I didn't watch. It mixed the traditional elements of a sitcom with musical performances on each show by Bio and Moran. In fact, the beginning credit sequence of the show had them singing to each other. Their backup band consists of a spaced out drummer named Bingo and Chachi's blase cousins Mario and Annette. The series also starred Ellen Travolta, no relation to John, as Luisa Del Vecchio, Chachi's mother, and Al, Marin, Al Molinaro as Al Del Vecchio, Chachi's stepfather, and formerly the owner of Arnold's Drive-In in Happy Days. And he opened a restaurant called Del Vecchio's, in which Chachi and Joni performed most of their music. Art Metrano played Chachi's uncle, Rico Mastorelli, who was the band's manager and helped Joni and Chachi advance in their careers. Winifred Friedman played Rico's daughter, Annette, Chachi's cousin and bandmate. The show debuted as a mid-season replacement and initially attracted happy or high ratings, happy days, high ratings, getting those confused, benefiting from two factors. It aired immediately following its parent series, Happy Days, and had only reruns competing for its time slot. The ratings plummeted in season two with a move to Thursday nights, which put Joni Las Chachi up against the A team. Ooh, unlucky. And it was pulled from the schedule by the year's end. The characters were rolled back into Happy Days for that program's final season, and ABC determined that the show was losing too much of its lead in, suggesting low appeal if the show were moved. In 2010, TV Guide Network listed the show at 17 on its list of 25 biggest TV blunders. And Scott Bio later recalled, and I quote, all the Happy Days people had written the first four episodes when the show got picked up for the series. But then they left to go back to Happy Days and we were stuck with new writers who didn't know us. So that was a problem. And then some of the people on the show had chemical issues and that was a problem. It was just on and on and on. And it just sort of crumbled and fell apart. In retrospect, if given the choice again, I would not have done that show. That was just the wrong idea. If I had to do it all over again, I would have waited till Happy Days was over, until I did anything else. Do you agree with uh, Scott Bio there? I thought it was quite good, to be honest. And I didn't think it was that bad, to be honest. I haven't seen Happy Days, but that's another, you know, that's another thing. Yeah, I mean, we we we, we will get to the. The, the parent shows obviously we've done Grange Hill of, of course but of course we will we will probably have to run back Grange Hill at some point in the not too distant future but yeah we'll we'll talk about Happy Days but uh, uh, do you know what it's a standalone show you know basically seeing this for the first time I thought it was pretty damn good it's just like a kind of sitcom style you know same as a lot of other sitcoms but it wasn't bad I mean look the, the I thought the theme song was cute you know them them singing together. Yeah, I mean, I thought I thought it was I thought it was okay. I think a lot of people would have watched this and thought this ain't Happy Days. Where's Fonzie? Where is he at? Uh, they're all just thinking, uh, yeah, I'm sure everyone was just watching it thinking, and they actually did bring him in for one episode. That's just uh, I thought I and I did watch that episode. Uh, I didn't watch it, was... it, but I was like, I, was, I saw it on the list, and I was like, mm, I'm gonna wait because I haven't seen Happy Days. I feel like I'm cheating. Yo. And he, he, yeah, they, they literally brought him back and he did the whole gimmick with the whole opening the door and then a girl comes into his arms. And yeah, I, I think it was what they thought, OK, this this show ain't working. We, we need we need to. We need to bring in the ratings. I mean, my kind of 
opinion of the show is going to be a bit sketchy a little bit because Bugsy Malone is one of my favorite films of all time. Scott Bio is, of course, Bugsy Malone. And now that he came out as a big right wing Trump supporter, yeah, it is one of the things. It just it killed my childhood, man. Seeing all of that and listening to him, I just thought, oh, what a damn shame, man. Because I, but I, I love Bugsy Malone. I, I watch it all the time. I might even just get Brick Box just to watch it again because I know it's on Brick Box. But honestly, it's, it's a super film. He's great in it. Yeah, this, yeah, I think this show was fine, and that's about as far as it will go. Like there was a, obviously it was very, very sitcommy. It's very woo and ha 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 ha, laugh track here and there, and yeah, it, it it had all the moving parts, but I just think yeah, it was a bit daft to kind of just put this still while Happy Days was very much a thing. I don't know, maybe they were just trying to like get a get a head start and try and like uh well i'm assuming they got written out right before this was no because they go back on happy days don't they for the no no no, they got yeah but they got written out in as much as they moved away or whatever it was right they must have surely i don't know i mean again it was it was it was silly to kind of do it while happy days was very much a thing because like i said they just go back yeah, I just wonder if they left and then they're like, oh, I really miss those guys. And then they had to make it like a spin off. Do you know what I mean? I don't. I mean, they, I think they just kind of did it maybe because they were the some of the, uh, apart from Fonz, they were like the, 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 probably the two characters maybe people were most intrigued to see what they would do outside of the Happy Days bubble. But. I think as a concept, it probably didn't work because Happy Days was still very much in the minds of everybody. I think if they did this after Happy Days had ended, it might have been a different... Yeah, well, I'm a prime example of that, right? I thought it was okay and I hadn't watched it or didn't know any of that, so I thought it was okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it was was probably a good enough idea. I think Scott Bayer was probably still... And and obviously... um, Aaron Moran, they were still young enough and they were still relevant enough. So I, I guess that's why they kind of did it. But yeah, in, in reality, I don't think it uh, I don't think it worked out. So yeah, let's talk about episodes. Uh, right, so like I said, I watched one and then the yeah, last one. Uh, first note is the spin-off of Happy Days. Uh, I know it, but I haven't really seen it. Joni and Chachi singing in the club for the intro. It's like a theatre beginning of a man trying food and then ends up getting... Oh, yeah, because the first bit is when Al comes in and he's like, it's, it's very theatre, uh, the first the first scene. Uh, so then I think you see, what's his name? Chachi comes in and he's desperate to see Joni, but mum says it's going to be in love a month. Then loads of relatives come in and they're like, ey, 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 ey. and it's like, oh, God. Anyway, so Al is the name of the husband. Uncle Enrico is the head of the, head of the family, or he thinks he is, and he comes in to meet Al. So they like each other, or at least Enrico likes him. So he's telling them there's he's because uh, I was re- opening a restaurant tonight, and he says, "Oh, you need music," and he kind of like shoehorns his band in. Charlie's singing in the band, and he's giving him the uh, the the the, uh, the cousins like you said earlier. So Bingo's a drummer; he's like a hippie out there guy. And he said they met in another life, and he owed him a dollar. Johnny hasn't arrived yet. Charlie's going solo for now, at least. Everyone's enjoying the music. And Chachi's like kind of playing up to the girls in the crowd and he like even kisses one of them and then Joni walks in. Uh, later that night, Chachi is signing autographs and Joni comes in. Uncle Rico isn't impressed with Joni's look. Then they said Joni's missed Goody two shoes and wants to, and she wants to prove him wrong. So Joni comes in with like this kind of like sexy outfit. Chachi doesn't want to play into the crowd. He keeps trying to cover her up. And Uncle Enrico likes Joni now and he wants her to mingle with the crowd. A man is coming to her and... Chachi steps in, then Chachi accidentally punches Joni in the face. <laughs> and then Joni's parents are concerned that Al won't stand up to Enrico, so he does. Joni and Chachi stay together for the summer, and they are happy again the end. I like how they're just talking about the old days. Because obviously they're like, now that we were kids, it used to be easy. She would just go bowling until we go to movies. Now you have to kind of think about grown-up things and, 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 and things of that nature. So, I, oh yeah, I thought that was quite nice. And yeah, I watched Fonzie's Visit. 
So this is probably like a, a desperate attempt to try and get some ratings for this show. Try and get the most one of the most iconic TV characters of all time. And yeah, so they they're getting ready for an audition, Joni and Chachi. Joni's getting nervous about it. They're packing up all their music sheets, equipment, so on and so forth. Fonzie walks in to big whoops and cheers. Woo! And he's obviously like, yo, and all this stuff. And but they have to, but obviously they've got an audition, so they're just basically rushing out the door. And Al is worrying that Chachi doesn't see him as a father. And Al is like, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, what you call it? I'm gonna go and hug him. And I'm gonna I'm gonna give him a kiss and I'm gonna say, I love you, son. But then Fonzie walks in. And so they forget the tambourine, so they're all going, you know what, let's all go and let's go give it to them. Annette's getting nervous and she's getting Mario nervous and they're all freaking out. The producer's like, I want something different. I want a band with a gimmick. So they pretend to be one big family. And Louisa walks in with a tambourine. And so they're like, you know what? We're a big band. Fonzie's the dad. Louisa's the mom. And we're all going to be in the band. Yeah, they're all pretending that Fonzie's the dad. Chachi's asking Fonzie to play along. And obviously, Joni's telling Louisa to play along. They're all performing together. And Fonzie and Louisa break out into a, a dance instead of playing instruments. They end up getting the gig. Al runs in saying, listen, I'm proud of you. And... Obviously, they're like, um, Fonzie's the dad, and he walks in saying that. And they're like, look, look, we're trying to explain, we're trying to explain. But then Al, like, walks out, and he's, like, upset about it all. Fonzie's not too happy either about all the lies. So Chachi goes to tell the producer the truth. And so the producer's like, okay, fine. Thank you for telling me the truth. You can still have the job. And, yeah, Fonzie's clicking his fingers. Girl comes into his arms. And he's like, I gotta, I gotta see someone about this, yo. And he's all, hey, and like opening the door. And all you needed was a jukebox, and then it would have uh, completed the gimmick. Chachi saying sorry to Al for hurting his feelings. They tell him that obviously they got caught up at the moment. And Chachi saying, look, I'm happy that you're my dad now. They finally hug, and it finishes with Joni and Chachi trying to write a song for their new gig. And yeah, the final episode I also watched was the elopement episode. Cool, do you want to fill in the gaps if I miss any then? So it's a big party, it's a 15th anniversary for Gina and Rio. They eloped when they were younger. And they... What was Auntie, it? Auntie Gina and Uncle Guido. Are you sure? Like Guido Fawkes. Guy I Fawkes. I, thought, I don't know why I thought of Guido Fawkes. I've it's written like... Reno down for some reason. I'm sure it was written on the thing. Anyway, so... Uh, it was they're... written on the thing, yeah, on the banner. Auntie Gina and Uncle Guido. Oh, I've written Reno for some reason. Um, so they eloped and they live happily ever after. Joni and Chachi sing for them. Uh, Chachi suddenly proposes to Joni to marry him tonight, but she says no, but ask me again someday. Chachi's sleeping. Joni climbs through the window and she's all dressed up. And she says, right, I've changed my mind. Let's get married. Al comes into Chachi's room. Annette has caught them, but they told her she's not going to the wedding. Annette tells Al and Louisa, and she's sad. They come back. They're going to a store to pick something up, but they end up getting locked in there. I think they needed something, needed to uh, pick something up from there. So Al was trying to console Joni, and Al goes downstairs. He finds them, and they have like a whose house you're going to stay in argument. And Al gives him a reality check, like you know you've got to get a job and do this and do that. Who's going to pay for this? Where are you going to live? So Al and Chachi come back in, and they decide not to get married. Joni tells them off, and Joni says. We would like to be there when you're old enough and responsible enough to get married. Yeah, I think you pretty much got everything there. I did like the uh, Al trying to like mess with their heads in the basement where he was like, yeah, I'm happy for you guys. I want you guys to work out. You don't need money. You got love. Kind of a realistic reality check, right? Yeah, because obviously, that, obviously that's the thing. Like, If you tell kids, hey, man, don't do anything. They're going to live the rest of their lives trying to prove it to you. That's the thing with kids. Like you you got to like tread carefully when you're saying to them, oh, you know what? Don't do that, man. Hey, hey, stay away from there. That's exactly where they're going to go. Yeah, I mean, it's true. But the thing is, like, obviously, we've all been there when kids, right? I mean, we, you know, it's all not old people. But um, 
old, the older people have had life experience. They've been there and they've done that. But there's just no telling kids. No, no. I I was like that. You couldn't tell me nothing. I'm going to be a footballer. I don't care what you say. I will literally be outside just kicking a ball. That's what they're like. Oh, you're not going to be a footballer. Watch me. It's, 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 it's one of those things, isn't it? Like, yeah, it's, it's one of those things that you have to kind of manage sort of thing. You kind of got to... Sometimes you got to let someone do their mistakes so they kind of have to learn for themselves. I think that's... Uh, yeah, I completely agree. I think it's um, it's one of those things is you you either learn, learn vicariously or not, right? I think I'm probably quite good at learning vicariously through others' misfortune mm. and mistakes and whatever. Yeah. And success. Uh, yeah. But I, you know, whatever saves me time, to be honest. Yeah. It is. It, yeah. I mean, it is what it is. Obviously, I'm, I'm not a parent. You are. So uh, it's something that you'll probably have to contend with much sooner than I am. So uh, <laughs> there you go. Next up, we've got Tucker's Luck. So this show came out in March 1983 and some of the things happening in the world. The Balearic Islands and Madrid become autonomous communities of Spain. The first collection of 12 swatch models was introduced in Zurich, Switzerland. Motown celebrates its 25th anniversary with the television special Motown 25, Yesterday, Today, Forever during which Michael Jackson performs Billie Jean and famously does The Moonwalk. Monty Python's The Meaning of Life was in the cinemas. And Let's Dance by David Bowie was in the charts. David Bowie is not one of my favourite artists, man. It's, I find it's his such music... a great song, though. Yeah, I Let's find his music dance. very strange. It's not that strange. I, I, I think David Bowie is fantastic. Honestly, I don't. I honestly I don't. Think I think I think his music is like um is not that good. I think yeah, let's dance. Oh, what a great, what a great tune this is. Because obviously he married a Son Miley woman as well. So yeah, I've always got a little bit of time for uh for 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 old uh, David Bowie. But honestly, yeah, like Starman, Life on Mars. Yeah, I don't like him. I don't. I don't like these songs. He's yeah, they, no, I, I think I think he's he's absolutely ace, David Bowie, and uh, yeah, yeah, like it's one of those things where like Prince, everybody everybody talks about how amazing Prince is, but I never really vibed with Prince. Yeah, kind of like that, and probably like Adele in the modern day, everybody loves Adele. I think I I think Adele is a great musician, but her music I just can't, you know what I mean? I can't I can't vibe with her music, but. That's a takeaway that she's awesome and, and whatever. So I, I totally get why there might be certain artists who are revered by the whole world and his wife. But yeah, but I don't know. Prince and Adele were like the two for me where I thought. See, I quite like both of those artists. Awesome so. musicians. They are great. Fantastic. They are super talented. But yeah, me personally, I just couldn't. I can't vibe with their uh, with their with their songs and music. Tucker's Luck. So this was a uh, TV series and a spin-off from the school drama Grange Hill and capitalised on the popularity of one of the series' original characters, Peter Tucker Jenkins, and played by uh, Todd Carty. Tucker's Luck follows the exploits of Tucker and his friends, Alan Humphreys, played by George Armstrong, and Tommy Watson, Paul McCarthy, after they had left school and their attempts to find employment and cope out there in the real world. Three series were made, although by series three, Tommy was gone. His absence explained by him having decided to join the Navy, with several former Grain Chill cast members reprising their roles for the spin-off, such as Linda Slater as Susie McMahon, who was Alan's former school girlfriend, Michelle Herbert as Tucker's old-class enemy, Trisha Yates, in the final episode, and... Peter McNamara as Tucker's nemesis and subsequent friend Ralph Passmore, believe it or not, in the first episode, the the tall nutter that was chasing after them, they become friends in like series two. And the program never really came close to matching the popularity of Grange Hill, which is uh, normal. And yeah, the third and final series saw the appearances of Tucker's younger sister, eight year old Rona, who had never been seen or referred to previously, and Tucker's elder brother Barry albeit only mentioned as our kid in uh, Grange Hill. And yeah, some uh, some flowers for Todd Carty. Obviously, 
you know him as Mark Fowler in uh, EastEnders. In yeah, that's literally 19. my first note on this, Mark Fowler. Yeah, it's, it's Mark Fowler. Obviously, the, the, the AIDS storyline, which probably went a long way to m- making people aware about this. And obviously, the, the, the big confrontation with uh, Peggy at the, the Queen Vic, where she was like, get out of my pub. And obviously, he's like... Is that when he's like, I ain't got AIDS, I've got the virus of it? Yeah, and obviously, he's like, you can't catch it with me, like... Drinking from the pub and 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 all of that. I actually watched his um, "This Is Your Life" because it was on the uh, the YouTube link. So it was a, it was a a good episode of of "This Is Your Life," the the show that yeah that that gives you your flowers. I think I think it came out in the year two thousand. That particular um, episode of Todd Carty's uh, "This Is Your Life." And obviously, yeah, it's 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 a nice show, man. It's 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 giving celebs their flowers, and apparently, the Jill Dando one came out in 1996, not 1999, as I had originally thought. So I found that. Oh, really? Um, okay. Find that quite interesting because I because I thought that they did it just before she was killed, but obviously they did they they did it a while ago. But she was, yeah, I don't know they, Cause, 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 I, cause, in '99 she was about to get married, but obviously they're talking about this is your last saying she was about to get married. But I think I don't think it worked out with that first one, and she was going to get married again in '99. And yeah, incidentally, she was 60 uh, a week ago. She or she would have turned 60 had she had uh, been alive. But yeah, Jill Dando, man, Jill Dando. Yeah. So talk to me about Tucker's luck. Your first introduction into peter tucker jenkins yeah i mean obviously i I, everyone knows i haven't seen grange hill or you know obviously i listened to the episode of grange hill that we covered but i really liked this show i thought it was pretty pretty good like you know just a couple of characters to keep track of and you know up to shenanigans yeah and they get like you know those i don't know what you call you know those guys in the thing like these kind of like national front kind of geezers yeah, me too. I I've really liked this show. Obviously, I know Tucker Jenkins and 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 watching uh watching Grange Hill, so I kind of know his character. It was great to kind of see what he gets up to when he's uh all grown up, or well, not necessarily all grown up, but like leaving school. Obviously, I do I do like that that they portray the reality of leaving school. So obviously, he wasn't the most studious person in the world. That's why he had to sign on, and he left school. Yeah, he had, he left school early. You see throughout the series that he regrets that, and you're just kind of like seeing his growth and seeing his uh, development. This was a really, really good show, and he's a really, really good character. Like I, I like Tucker. I would have loved to have been his mate at school. He's someone who like looks out for his mates. Someone who's always like. The first to defend his mates, he's a cheeky chappy, so he so he'll always get into a, a spot a spot of bother. But yeah, he he he's very loyal to his friends, very loyal to his family. And you, the the only disappointing thing about Tucker's luck is that they didn't have Benny in it, and obviously Benny was um he's a black friend, and he was the very first character you see on Grange Hill, so you could tell Phil Redman was thinking way left when he came out with Grange Hill because obviously he was like, this is going to be an inner school and we want it to represent inner schools in inner city London and and so on and so forth and the very very first scene in Grange Hill you see uh, Benny who's like kicking a ball and obviously he was black and he he becomes friends with uh, Tucker so it was yeah, it's just one of those things where it would have been nice to have um nice to have had him on the show, but obviously and and even in Grange Hill, I'm I can't remember Tommy that much being friends with Tucker and Al. Like yeah, Al Al Al, Al, Al was like friends from like from, from day one. But I think Tommy just kinda of joined along in the end, but maybe they just thought, yeah, let's let's just have three white guys on there and Obviously, there's a there's a link between that 
he's not the only EastEnders character that was in uh, Tucker's Luck. I think we saw Billy Mitchell there as well. He was in a few episodes. Yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 I did watch Tucker's Luck a few years ago. And yeah, yeah. Perry Fenwick, who plays Billy Mitchell, was in it. I think Lynn from EastEnders, Lynn Slater, she was in Tucker's Luck. She was in the very first episode. She was the one that was trying to flirt with the guy at the job center. That was her. Yeah, that's 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 her. Um, you you also had um, Polly from the Bill in one episode I watched. She was everywhere, man. She 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 got her acting reps, man. Good for her. Started young and 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 and, and carried on as you, as you were. But um, I thought I thought this was a super show. And yeah, let's let's get into episodes. Uh, Peter is in bed. I say Peter because obviously I didn't know it was even Tucker to begin with. He's having a day off and he has to sign off in the morning. Sign on this morning, sorry. He goes out to Tommy's house, but Tommy went to Tucker's house. Then he goes to Alan's house and Alan's sad because he didn't take Susie home. So everyone basically got drunk last night. Tommy's walking with someone. Alison is like this other girl, guy's girlfriend, he thinks or they think or whatever. Anyway, so apparently this guy's called Passmore and he might get the amp if he, if he keeps talking to the girl. And he says... He might ask a girl, but then some like national front looking chaps come in and like he runs off. So Tommy runs off and gets on the bus. The ticket man comes for the fare, but he's like just kind of froze up out of the bus. Tucker is uh, with Al still and Alice having eggs. They have no conversation about school and how he liked painting sets and he wish he could just done that. You know, what? I think he was, he was making a really valid point. So he's like, what's the difference if I don't know how long the Amazon is, but obviously I can't. I, I didn't learn the trade. I don't know how to do, do a plug. Like I don't, I don't really know how to do a plug. I could just about change a light bulb. Yeah, I think I think this. Yeah, it's it's, it's a vocational versus academic debate, right? Well, see, of course, it's important to know, learn about sums and 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 learn about all those things. But yeah, I think I think he was making a really valid point about school. I I, I did like this conversation that the that him and. Uh, him and Alan were having. Yeah, it was a very good conversation. Also, like, you know, in terms of careers, like, he could he could have done painting sets for a career. Do you know what I mean? But if everyone just, oh, you're a naughty little kid, you know, that's when it, that's when people fall by, by the wayside. But, you know, there's painters and decorators for film and TV sets. There's painting and decorators for houses. There's paint... No one tells you this when you're, like, you know, when you're at school. No. Like, imagine being, like, a chippy or a plumber or whatever for a TV set. That's so cool. Like, all these things that they, you know, they're using, like, movies have to be painted by someone so tommy comes in they all end up going out they all go to the doll office together always being cagey about Susie. she don't want to know since she went to college mandy and another girl are talking about men with no money and they go to the job center and then they're having a who would ask who out conversation who should ask who out the guy or the girl so they ask some guy but he has a girlfriend tucker Back in the doll office, Tucker's missed his appointment, so he doesn't get his gyro. Now he has to go see the supervisor. Tommy and Al are like, I'm leaving because I'm waiting here all day with you. Al goes to the college, waits for his girl, but she doesn't come. Tommy's waiting on the doorstep of someone, Allison, and then the the boys come and chase him off. They run past Al, and he helps Tommy with the chase, and then Tucker, come, Tucker comes in too, like all fighting together. They all run off, get into Dad's car, and they drive off. Then they say, we'll have to get a job soon because this is too much excitement. Yeah, and that's the end of episode one. So series two, episode one, was a party. There's no drinks left. Lads are talking about their girls not being around. Um, They're all walking home, drunk and singing. They come across a guy who's sleeping in a car. Al's uncle is waiting for them. Alan is not happy that his uncle moved in after his dad died. Um, And Al is really rude to his uncle. And he says, he reckons his uncle's here to get his hands on the house, which has been left to him in the, the, um, because his dad had no will. Uh, some people in the family are looking to basically his, his uncle tells him he said listen some people in the family are, are looking to contest uh, your inheritance because you're not responsible and he says and, and apparently his dad was running the business into the ground and he's in loads of debt his uncle's helping him but he's laying it down to him anyway so Stu and Tommy are in the bookies Stu broke his leg somehow Mandy and the other one is, <laughs> the other one the other lady are working in the shop Alan sees a man who's sleeping in his car in a cafe and the man and the, the guy that's sleeping in the van says, I, I want tea. But the waitress says, look, there's a minimum charge of 75 feet to stay. Turns out they just wanted to get rid of him because they knew he was homeless, but they wanted to give him some sort of like pride still. They see a man who knows about horses. Tommy thinks better of it and leaves. But the man was watching him and he says, like, 
come with me. You, I, I want you to put bets on because the bookies don't know you. So he he does that, and then uh, then the homeless geezer comes into a laundry. Alice talking to Creamy, as, as he's known, um, and he's and he basically he's desperate to help him. Al is good heart. Um, Tommy's going around to put bets on. He's done, and then um, he says, "I'll um, I won't take the money. I want a job instead." And he says, "Oh, you're cheeky," and he basically gives him some money, um, but says, "I'll be in touch." And then they all they all go to uh, Al's house. Alan, Tucker, and Creamy, and then they can see like his the kids trying to burn his car. So then Tucker runs out there and saves his car, and then he says, "Right, you can stay with me then." So all and he was the whole time he was trying to say, "Don't stay with me," but then Tucker was the one to say, "Come and stay with me." So next episode I watched was series two, episode five. Tucker's complaining about his job and the lack of flexibility, so he's basically a delivery guy on a motorbike. And this is where we see his uh, love for uh, motorbikes. And uh, Tucker and Tommy, they're basically uh, hanging out somewhere. And yeah, they're just hanging out at some uh, person's like den somewhere. Tommy wants to bring a girl at the hangout, but they all say no. And so Tommy's like, look, I'm, I'm, he's trying to go Tucker into coming to a gentleman's club. And uh, one of the girls, I think her name is Sarah. She's complaining about the men at the gentleman club being a bit weird and handsy. And Creamy, he's going shopping with his girl, and I think her name was Susie. He bumps into another man, and obviously the man is like, "You see, the problem with women is they want they always want you to go shopping with them, but then they complain when you're with them." So I'm thinking, yeah, fellas, when your when your lady's asking you to go shopping and you're doing the big shop, you just have to be quiet and just uh, do do your job, do the assignment. Don't don't be getting involved in nothing. And obviously, I have a little giggle about that. Tucker's trying to have lunch, but he gets call. He gets to call out to like go to the other side of London. He's driving really, really fast on his motorbike, and he almost collides with a kid. So, like, he's driving the motorbike. They see the kid, and then he just goes to another shot immediately. So you see, like, um, Creamy giving flowers to Tucker's mum, saying, "Oh, you know, thank you for everything." And so she's telling him, "Look, maybe you should go and." talk to your own mom and, and, and go see her. Luckily, Tucker doesn't hit the kid, but he takes it as a warning. He feels really bad about it. He switches off the boss. Like, the boss is calling. He switches it off, so he seemingly quits. And Creamy's girl is talking about wanting to volunteer abroad, and her mate is telling... Her mate, Sarah, is basically saying, look, he really likes you. Maybe you should uh, reconsider. And... Tommy's date, Lisa, doesn't like being at the gentleman's club. Creamy and Al are coming to the, the gentleman's club, but they aren't dressed. But Tommy's like, all right, fine, you can come in. Tucker's finally here, but he walks in with Creamy's girl. But he only brought her in just to, like, he doesn't, like, like her or anything. He just brought her in just because he was like, look, I just need someone. Obviously, uh, Tommy's like, look, you need to bring a girl. I always just thought, I'm just going to bring you. And it looks like that Tucker's upset both Sarah and Susie. And then Tucker is saying that, look, he just wanted to invite Susie because he wanted to just go out with a posh girl. And so everybody leaves. And so Al is like, oh, my God, this place is expensive. Three pounds for a pint. you got to be kidding me. And so, yeah, everyone's like, you know what? Look, we're all just going to leave. And so Al is like, Tucker and Tommy, not you two. You two can stay here. And so, yeah, that how it ended. Then I watched the finale. So it starts with Tucker being in, in college. And they're all talking about Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. And talking about how Lady Macbeth may have been the one to have coerced Macbeth into killing the king. And so they're trying to like talk about the themes of Macbeth. Man, yeah, Macbeth, Macbeth is hard, man. Macbeth goes hard. This is a great Shakespeare story. And so he's obviously still thinking about his ex-girlfriend, who I believe he dumped because she was racist. So that was another reason to uh, to like uh, Tucker. The teacher's talking to Tucker, and he wants to know why he isn't focusing in class. Obviously, he's like, look, this is college. I ain't going to tell you what to do. This ain't, this ain't me telling you off. You can do whatever the hell you want to do. But he's like, look, I, I think you're smart. I think you've got potential. Don't don't waste your opportunity. 
Barry, his brother, he's giving Tucker a hard time about losing his job, showing him all the bills to say, look, we've got to pay this, we've got to pay this, we've got to pay this, and you've gone and lost your job. We're going to, like, lose everything. And obviously Tucker's like to Barry, look, if you don't like it, you can leave. We were fine without you. I don't know why you even came back. And obviously Tucker's mum was like, I don't want you guys to argue. Sort yourselves out. I don't want to argue about money. Tucker reluctantly has to sign on, and he has to see the supervisor. And obviously she tells him that he can't sign on because he's going to school. And obviously you might be prosecuted because obviously it, cause I think the rules way back then was if you're studying for 20 hours, you're not allowed to sign on because that counts as full-time education. And obviously the teacher is telling Tucker that he can stay in the class unofficially and sign on because he's trying to get a grant for a course that he's doing. And as the teacher's like, look, you ain't heard it from me. I, I ain't trying to lose my job here. But there are some students who will like tell the course that they quit, quote unquote, but they'll stay in the class and they'll still get the gyro money. Tucker's filling out his form for the grant. He's not getting anywhere because obviously he's like um, trying to talk to the, the 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 lady at the office. Obviously she's like, I can't help you. You need to leave. And obviously she's like, I've already sent my form. What do you want me to do? I can't help you. So he basically goes upstairs, looks for the boss. Trisha Yates, who used to go to school with him, notices Tucker. And it's like, I know him. And then Tucker bumps into his brother and his mates and they go to find Barry's car. They get into a scrap and they find out some info. They meet some hard men. One of them was called Harris. And Barry, and they're obviously they're trying to burn Harry's car. They get into a fight with Harris and the bad guys. Barry takes Harris's car as insurance and they leave. Then Tucker meets up with Al at the gym. And obviously he's like, you know, because I think, yeah, Al is leaving for Devon. And so they're getting ready for his leaving too. Tucker then goes to see the, the manager in charge of the grant. His name was Mr. Moriarty. Obviously Mr. Moriarty's like, hang tight. Things are moving in the right direction. Don't worry about it, sort of thing. And so obviously, look, that doesn't mean anything to me. I've already set out forms. I haven't heard anything for a long time. Please help me. And obviously, that look, I gotta go. I I can't help you right here, right now. Just wait. So Mr. Moriarty's car goes flat. Tucker helps him, and obviously, he's like, look, okay, one good turn deserves another. Put your name down, and I will see what I can do. And then Trisha bumps into Tucker again. And obviously they're like, oh, I know you from school. And I, yeah, every, yeah, Tucker and Trisha had the love-hate relationship at school where she, he used to call her Pongo. Because I don't know, if, it might have been because she had a, a long face, 101 Dalmatians. And so there, they're just talking. And then obviously he's like, are you single? And he's like, yeah, I'm single. Are you single? Yeah, I'm single. And obviously he invites Trisha to Al's leaving drinks. And obviously he's like, it's going to get real, real, it's going to get real hectic in here. It's going to get messy. And then obviously she's like, look, I'm going to wash my hair. But are you free the next day? And he's like, yeah, I'm free the next day. Let's uh, meet up and let's have a, a drink. And then obviously it ends with them walking out of the parking lot together, which I thought was very nice. What a really, really good show. It was pretty good. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have, to, I have to say I enjoyed the episodes I watched and didn't um, didn't clock watch or anything like that. I thought, yeah, I thought it was pretty damn decent. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Tucker's luck was was awesome, and yeah, we will do Grain Trail at some point again. Last but not least, Joey. So this show came out in September two thousand and four, and some of the things happening in the world. San Francisco Giants outfielder Barry Bonds hits his seven hundredth career Major League Baseball home run of San Diego's Jake Peavy. Ed Whitlock becomes the first person over 70 to complete a marathon in under three hours at the Toronto Marathon. The first images of a live giant squid in its natural habitat are taken 600 miles south of Tokyo. Shaun of the Dead was in the cinemas. Amazing movie. And Love Machine by Girls Aloud was in the charts. Joey! This was a American sitcom created by Scott Silveri and Shanna Goldberg Meehan and a spin-off slash sequel to Friends starring Matt LeBlanc reprise, reprising his role as Joey Tribbiani. Midway through the second season, the show was placed on hiatus but returned in a new time slot and only one episode, Joey and the Snowball Fight, was shown in the new time slot 
for the show ended up being pulled by NBC when it was overshadowed in its ratings by American Idol. NBC then cancelled the series due to poor ratings. It centers on Joey Tribbiani, who has struck out on his own and moved to Hollywood, hoping to truly make it as an actor. And after reuniting with his high-strung sister Gina, who is a strong and sexy hairdresser, Joey moves in with his genius 20-year-old nephew, the graduate student Michael, who is a rocket scientist. He begins a romance with Superintendent Alexis Garrett and becomes close with his inspiring actor Zach Miller. And after the series finale of Friends in 2004, LeBlanc signed on for the spin-off series Joey following Joey's move to Los Angeles. Friends producers Marta Kaufman and David Crane were not interested in the spin-off, although Kevin S. Bright agreed to be exec producer along with Joey creators Scott Silveri and Shannon goldberg Meehan, the latter of whom left the show after the first season and was replaced. The series initially did well in the Nielsen's rating in its first season and was subsequently renewed for a second. But in the second series, Miguel was added to the show as a regular and Jennifer Coolidge had a more permanent role. And the remaining episodes had never been broadcast by NBC, but have been shown on various other networks around the world. And incidentally, episode 5 and episode 13 were directed by David Schwimmer, who played Ross Geller in Friends. NBC heavily promoted Jerry and gave it the Friends Thursday 8pm time slot. The pilot was initially watched by 18.6 million American viewers, but ratings continually decreased throughout the series. Two seasons, averaging 10 million viewers in the first season and 7 million in the second. And Kevin S. Bright had a reason why Joey was cancelled and what he thought was, and I quote, On Friends, Joey was a womanizer, but we enjoyed his exploits. He was a solid friend, a guy you knew you could count on. Joey was a deconstructed, was deconstructed to be a guy who couldn't get a job, couldn't ask a girl out. He became a pathetic, mopey character. I felt he was moving in the wrong direction, but I was not heard. Joey won the People's Choice Award for Favourite New Television Comedy and Matt LeBlanc won Favourite Male TV Star. LeBlanc was also nominated for the Golden Globe Award for Best Actor in a TV Series, Musical or Comedy. Little pop quiz. Do you know the name of the character that Joey Tribbiani played in Days of Our Lives? I do, but I've forgotten it. Ah, uh, uh, Doctor something. Yeah. Well, obviously, Doctor. Um, Dr. Drake. Ramore. Yes, Dr. Drake Ramore. That's who he was. Obviously, on some of the other characters, there was Gina, who was uh, temperamental and promiscuous. She's not very bright, but she was streetwise. She's a caring but overprotective, domineering mum. There was Alex, who was a next-door neighbour, landlady and friend. She's an educated yet slightly ditzy blonde lawyer who graduated from Northwestern University and Pepperdine University School of Law. Michael Tribbiani, who idolizes his uncle Joey's ability to date many women and who himself is sheltered and nervous around girls. And Bobby Morgenstern, who was the agent of Joey and the 12th most powerful woman in Hollywood. So, Joey... This is a pretty. It's a. It's a good like sequel, kind of like a sequel, like a spin-off. Sorry, like a. I found a lot of the episodes didn't have a lot of substance to them. Friends kind of had, you know, over the obviously it had like a ten, ten, twenty year run or whatever it had, but you know, it just it just seemed to be like shenanigans. That being said, I'm a I'm a fan of um, Matt LeBlanc, and I think he's yeah, he's yeah, great yeah. Honestly, it's 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 very difficult because. It's one of those things where, yeah, you like Matt LeBlanc. You like Joey Tribbiani. On paper, really, this should work. But I'm afraid it didn't. Ah, uh, yeah. It was, it was, yeah, it was fine. It kind of got the little cute laughs here and there. Like when he's in Dallas and not in LA. Yeah, that made me laugh. Like, actually made me straight up it's, laugh. It's, it's, it's vintage Joey Tribbiani, but it was... Yeah, they tried so hard. I don't, you know, fault them. But it's one of those things where they they just kind of said after the middle of the second season, bro, this ain't working, man. This ain't working, bro. We need to... 
move on from this. And... Let's just try to milk it a little bit. Like, you know, some of the stuff that Matt LeBlanc's done, like, you know, even Top Gear, like, it's great in that. I've not, I've not actually seen the Top Gear with uh, the new presenters. As much as people hated Jeremy Clarkson and Richard and James, I actually did like Top Gear and I did like watching those guys, even though, yeah, they they might not be the the best people in the world. I I did genuinely like their Top Gear and I did like watching them. But I'd I'd never watched any of them. But that being said, I really enjoyed watching them and and I, but I haven't watched, I've only watched one episode of the Grand Tour. Like, I don't see it as like, like, uh, Top Gear was one of the last things I ever watched on TV. You know, like you know what TV as it as it comes on in the whenever it comes on. <laughs> I mean, I ain't searching for it. You know, honestly, yeah. Like I said, it's 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 yeah. There was a reason why the main producers of Friends didn't want nothing to do with this. The main reason why I think the the the, the actors and the characters didn't want anything to do with it. I'm sure Matt LeBlanc will look back at this and thought, yeah. Forget about it. I don't really want anything to do with this show myself. And I mean, that's true, but it's still paying. I mean, whatever. Like... Well, uh, well, it got cancelled. So from from a pride point of view, I don't think he would have liked that too much. I'm not really sure what they would have paid him. It'd have been pretty handsome to convince someone to do that. Well, to be to stay on TV and to still be relevant, even though the show wasn't great. I think if you're an actor. I think you'd made enough in Friends and it would have been fine to this day. But like with Joey, yeah, I don't think he would look back on this one fondly. Mm. I mean, I necessarily don't want to look back at this too fondly because, yeah, it was it was no. Yeah, it just it just didn't work, just did not work. And they did everything in their power to make it work. But no, yeah, I'm amazed it made it past the first season. But yeah, there you go. Right, let's talk about episodes. Uh, right, so I watched two, watched episode one and two. So Joey's gone to LA, accidentally gone to Dallas because he had a lay- layover in Dallas and he was trying to go ha- go to his place. So Ginny meets him and as his sister and now he's in a cop show. Michael, Ginny's son comes on. He's 20 now. He's a rocket scientist. He wants to move in with Joey. Alex comes in to see him. She lives next door. Michael is on set and Joey tells him it's not a good idea to move in. And Joey gets a call and his show won't air. He has no work now. Michael is cooking for Joey and he's, now he's allowed to live there. There's a job going for a TV host. Uh, Gina comes round to cut his hair, but she can't because she's so upset about Michael moving out. She doesn't know who he's moving in with, but then he comes in and she gets upset and storms out. He has an audition, but he keeps turning to the wrong camera. Like the tally light comes on, he goes to the, looks at the other camera. And uh, Michael decides not to stay uh, because of his mum, but then Joey has it out of his sister and she ends up agreeing to let him stay. In episode two, Gina comes to stay with Michael. She has a key, that, and, but they don't want her to have a key, So she, but she's got loads of spares. Michael wants her to learn things from Joey, so he'll take him to a bar. The girl, Alex, who next door, she's the superintendent. And he gets loads of notes of what to do. Uh, they go out. Gina knocks on the door. They don't want to go. Don't want her to go with them. She's not happy about it. Uh, whilst they're in the bar, they get an anonymous tip off that there's an underage guy there drinking. Michael is obviously the guy that's drinking. And Gina made the call, so they go. They, Gina will go on a night out. Joey has it out with Alex in the super. She says it's not her job; it's her husband's job. But he's away a lot. On the night out, Michael gets annoyed with all the advice and asks them both to leave. Michael comes back and he got a number, and then Michael tries his lines out on Joey. At the stars because he's a rocket scientist and that's the end cool so yeah i watched uh season two episode no i watched is this the finale yeah i think it's the finale of season one so joey and the moving in so yeah joey's asking his girlfriend sarah to move in only because he didn't want her to leave alex tells joey that because i think alex gets divorced and she's telling joey look someone asked me out joey's calling his agent to see if he can get tickets for the new Star Wars film because Michael wants to go. And Joey and Sarah are doing shopping for their big moving in. Joey accidentally picks up a baby monitor. And obviously there's a dude like to him going, are you moving in with your girl? Get out while you can! And Sarah says him that something is wrong and has a panic attack about moving in with Joey. And obviously Joey's like, look, I want you to stay. I love you. And yeah, so Joey has to do a promo for his new TV show. And they have to find out, obviously, the promo is like, who's getting killed? 
is it me? Me, me. And obviously Joe's getting freaked out. So he's like, I don't want to lose my job. And Michael has to go watch the film with Joey's agent, who's got a crush on him. Alex is getting excited about her first date in 10 years. And Howard assures Joey that he will vote to save Joey, but the vote isn't to vote to save. It's to vote like, oh, I don't want Joey to, to be killed. So obviously he's voting for Joey to get killed, even though that's not the thing. Gina promises to deal with Bobby and Michael is encouraging her. Alex leaves a date on and isn't ready. Wants Joey to get rid of the date. Joey manages to get rid of him and Alex and Joey are hanging out. Alex manages to cheer Joey up because his girlfriend does a runner and runs off to DC anyway. Gina confronts Bobby about Michael and so Bobby's like, how dare you talk to me like that? When can he start working for me? And Joey and Alex are sad. And then Howard's voting for Joey instead of, yeah, like I said, Howard's voting for Joey instead of saving him. And so the finale, which I did find from a uh, New Zealand network, because they were showing the all series. And so, yeah, the finale is Joey filming an ad. And yeah, Jimmy, who's Michael's dad, comes back to the picture. And he's marrying Gina, and he wants Joey to be his best man. And Joey gets emotional and can't record the ad properly. He gets a call from his agent saying that he gets to throw the first pitch at the uh, LA Dodgers game. Joey offers to pay for the wedding. And Jimmy thinks that, and Jimmy's like telling Joey, you know, you think your girl might be into weddings too much. And obviously Alex just runs in with a wedding dress going, ah, it still fits, it still fits. And obviously Joey's like getting all freaked out. Michael thinks that he's the best man. So he's acting like the best man. Jimmy and Joey are talking outside and tells Joey that he could be embarrassed throwing the first pitch. The bachelor party isn't going to plan. And Alex is talking to Joey about marriage and he's getting freaked out. Alex tells Joey that she's never getting married. Because obviously Joey's like, oh, look, I don't want to get married. I don't get any ideas. And Alex is like, look, I'm never getting married again. Marriage never worked out for me. And Joey's struggling now with throwing baseballs. Alex tells Joey, look, you only want what you can't have. So obviously she's like, for example, here's a broccoli. And obviously Joey's like, I really want that broccoli. I was like, yeah, that's the whole point. Jimmy runs away and Joey and Michael are trying to catch up with him. They tell Jimmy that, look, he and Gene are meant to be together. Then they see Gene are planning on running away, but she gets caught and they both decide to run away. The Reverend is like kind of wait for them. And it was played by uh, the janitor from Scrubs, who I think is just, the absolute best and joey and alex are basically doing one another to get married she says i do but then joey chickens out and then gina and jimmy come back reverend marries them both and jo joey's at the dodger stadium alex reassures him and he goes out and obviously joey's like look i do love you maybe down the line we could get married but obviously not right now the pitch was a disaster Joey's doing all speeches saying that he's happy with his friends and he's happy with how things are. And yeah, that was Joey. It's fine, I guess. And uh, yeah, we've got to rank these shows now from three to one. Easy one for me this week. So third place, obviously, Joey. Um, not because it was that bad. Nothing was particularly bad this week, but it just had the least substance. Second one was Joni Loves Chachi. And in front was Tucker's Luck by A Country Mile. Yep, exactly the same. Joey at three, Joni loves Chachi at two. Uh, yeah, I thought Tucker's Luck was the best out of the three by a yeah, mile. It was really, and, really good. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was, it was, it was super. I thought the other two were incredibly average, and yeah, it was, it was something that they tried to make work, but for love nor money, they could not make work. And yeah, that's how it goes sometimes. And uh, on that note, I'll bring the episode to an end. Yesterday's Capers is available wherever you get your podcast from. We're available on all the podcast platforms. Turn on your notifications so that you can get new episodes all the time. And they should be out on Fridays and Saturdays. You can find us on the socials. On Instagram, it's Abdullah underscore Molim. On Twitter, it's Abdullah Molim, all one word. On yeah, Insta, Yesterday's Capers 1. Twitter, Yesterday Capers. YouTube.com forward slash Yesterday's Capers. Facebook.com forward slash Yesterday's Capers. Um, yeah, we're we're on all those all those platforms, all those things. Have a go, look for us, and see us. 
And uh, yeah, join us next time for another episode of Yesterday's Capers. <laughs>